Uh, there was a mistake. It said consultation twice. It's actually crown. Uh, so this is something I think everyone needs to know, but it's really important that you understand that since we've combined basic and advanced together, that this is an advanced topic. There is uh, a time to do crown work this afternoon for the physicians, but you should not be doing crowns in your first few years in practice. This is something that's truly an advanced topic. <clears throat> Disclosures. I made, uh, I think, 72 bucks this last year, so that's my disclosure. <laughs> How do you explain something a patient typically doesn't see, right? This is in the back of the head. How do you explain that to them if that's what they, what they would benefit from? How do you explain the benefits? Well, you have to present all sides of the picture. And to me, a lot of times, you just focus on how someone sees it from the back side. But really, it's all sides. So what does that mean? Well, let's talk about it. The obvious is the back. When someone's, you know, the bleachers behind you looking at you, or as Vance talked about in the, in the airplane, the baldness in the back is obvious. But the other thing, from a side view, and you'll see some before and afters, it creates a rounding effect. Because if you look at someone that's bald in the crown or balding, there's a flattening effect that you can see in that back side. And believe it or not, a good percentage of those hairs that arch upwards this way will actually create and improve visual density from the front. If you think about that, it's an, it'll add to the visual density. So I'll show you um, some concepts of how to uh, improve that. Who's a candidate? Patient selection is so important. So there's going to be some criteria. First thing is, in general, I would say over 35 years of age. Have I done anyone under 35? Yes, very few. But these are one of those things that, you know, just like when you started with the hairline yesterday in the workshop, you want to have parameters of safety. And why is that? Because you continue to lose hair and yet it gets wider and wider and wider and you get more and more problems with trying to cover your tracks. So if you got someone at 25 balding in the back, you know you may not ever have enough hair to cover that and you can have a natural result over time. So something you have to, to, to remember. The other thing is we have to think about how important the front is. When you guys were drawing hairlines yesterday, I was trying to emphasize you want to go low enough that there's an aesthetic frame to the face because you want to frame the face, but obviously not so low it's unnatural or they run out of donor hair. But the idea is that you want that aesthetic frame. So if you don't have that done, the crown is of secondary aesthetic importance. And you want to help a patient um, who may be focused on the crown at least to be educated. You don't want to force them to the front, but you want to educate them to consider the front being a, an area of prime importance. And sometimes it also looks unnatural. You do the crown and the front is completely empty. It just, the pattern doesn't represent nature. So you really want to look oftentimes at the Norwood patterns and memorize them so you understand what is natural, what's not. And you also want to highly consider stabilization of that hair with uh, finasteride, minoxidil, just to limit that progression. Is it a safety mechanism? Not really, because in ways you got to understand that if they take it or not take it, they may stop taking it. So you can never predict that you're going to bank everything on their continuing to take that, because once they stop, they lose everything they gained over the time they were on that medicine. Um, and also, remember, you, uh, it's, this is a law of supply and demand. So supply is back here, which constantly gets depleted, and demand can, continues to worsen as we get older. So that ratio worsens. So you have to mentally project not only where is the supply and demand issue today, but where is it going to be in 10 years, in 20 years. And that's why age is so important. That's why looking at the density back here, looking at how much you got to cover on the back, and making sure that you have the judgment to predict that you're not going to run out of hairs and leave the person a cripple. I'm, I use those words not lightly. Those words are truly what I see coming through the office, and you don't want to be the person committing that crime. So the other thing is you have to really educate a patient that they need more than one procedure over their lifetime. And that's true for anything. You heard that from Vance, you heard that from all the other lectures. But the crown is particularly important regarding that matter. So this is more of a theoretical uh, sort of thing that uh, Ziering did a study just looking at what percentages of different patterns are out there. So this is really not practical, but it's just so you understand these are the patterns that exist in nature with the percentage breakdowns you see on the bottom of the screen. Okay, so the, the clockwise world being the most common in men. The patterns that exist, it's a circle or oval type thing, or it can look sort of like a kidney bean. And then this other one is a coronet, and you really got to look for that sometimes. There's just a little shading at the bottom where if you wet the hair, you start to see that. We'll talk about that in a moment. But that extra little pattern, you heard that from Paul Shapiro, is that that little uh, extra little area below could be not a safe area to harvest from. Billboard effect. I don't know, who, I think, was it Parsley that came up with this? I don't know. It's a great concept. The, the billboard idea is, when you remember the box that I drew the other day, the back side of the head is a vertical plane. So people see it straight on. It means you're looking at bald scalp. It's much harder to hit a billboard and make it look 
dense because you're looking at it directly on versus from a side view, which you would be when you're looking at the top. Because this, you're seeing the, the bald scalp from a, a side view, you don't see this. So I always undersell the crown. I usually tell my patients, you may need two to get any kind of reasonable visual density. And it's important to undersell what you can deliver on the crown because it's difficult. Sometimes the take is not as good. It's very hard. And plus, the final thing is, you see this, the spiral effect. The graphs, instead of having, like in the front, all the soldiers, that is the graphs, lined up in a row and all interlocked and, and going back and helping each other to support each other's density, the crown is all spinning in a circle is picture of soldiers lying in a circle, they're not helping each other cover much density. So it's, it's harder to get visual density in the back because it's vertical and because every, all the graphs are in a circle. Planning the donor area. So remember what I said, look for that little coronet there. That's important that you see if there's extra loss around the bottom part. Wetting it can help or looking under some of those miniaturized hairs. And I need a lot. I mean, I harvest a long amount. You need to put a lot of graphs up there to get a result. I'm harvesting like 30 centimeters or so to try to get something in the crown. Most times, obviously depending on how big the crown is. And we'll talk about how wide an area to transplant right now. So the initial plan is, okay, that's what he needs. He needs this area to be covered. But is that all he needs. When you wet the hair, you start to see that there's actually a greater pattern of baldness that goes forward. And you really want to make sure that you cover that um, in that distance. In the older patient, you can be maybe a little more conservative because maybe he's not going to have much more regression or recession. In the younger patient, you got to be really careful because you know he's going to he's going to progress forward. So you want to protect against that and perhaps go a little bit beyond uh, that area so he doesn't start to develop that fringe too early. How about women? Do women lose crowns? Typically, not as much, but what I have found is, I call this a dumbbell design, which is the idea that they usually lose it uh, in this Christmas tree pattern. You'll hear that in my talk coming up, so we won't get into that right now. But there's sometimes a little involvement of the crown as well. So we'll talk more about this in my lecture coming up. But this idea is like, I see this sort of being a small uh, little circle in the back and then spreading up to the, the front and being a, a wider area in the front. So what are the, the regions of the crown? This is a little uh, anatomy so that we can speak the same lingo here. The, the, the central whorl, okay, that's the, the maybe a dime or quarter size center part where it's coming out. Uh, the upper arc, which is a, a very, very important aesthetic area. And we're going to talk about prioritizing aesthetic areas. And this may be an advanced talk. And again, if this goes over your head, you at least realize where you can aspire to in a few years. So this may not make all, all that sense for people just starting. The vertex transition point or vertex transition zone, you heard that. That's the transition going from the crown over to the mid scalp. That's vertical to horizontal plane. And then the lower arc, which is basically anything below the whirl point. So, the other thing that's important, you heard earlier when we talked yesterday about how hair grows, there are very few abrupt changes in the head. So if you look at the fringe of the, of the crown, it goes out like that in a radial fashion. Now you create the whirl at the beginning of the case as your start point, and you want to make sure the connections between are all smoothly uh, connecting over so there's no abrupt transitions. And this little point where you see the dotted line is where it sort of angles and slightly changes. So that's something that is important. You really think about how the hairs transition. There are no abrupt changes when you're working on the crown. So the preferred design in general is in a clockwise pattern if they do not have any noticeable ghost hairs left and is basically naked back there. Why is that? In general, the reason in terms of planning is that if you think about the way that the hair parts and the way that most right-handed people comb, it covers the part. Remember I said that visual density from the front is so important. So the part is where it's split open and you want to be able to see that it goes up and over like this. So it, it rises up over the part to cover the part visually from the front of the person. And it also e more easily combs with the patient because it follows the tra trajectory of his frontal hair. Hope that makes sense. Oops, sorry, I may have hit it twice. Sorry about that. Let me just... Okay. So then, how do you prioritize this? The numbers mean, where do I visually think is aesthetic priority? Just like when you're working in the front, visual aesthetic priority is central forelock, the center part, the hairline, and then diminishing, ret diminishing returns as you go back. Well, do you equ equally space the crown? No, because remember, I told you, it's already hard to get a great crown result, and if you just equally put the, the graphs there, you're going to not leverage what you can as an artist, and what you can do as a technician to think about this and prioritizing. So for me, that upper arc where it covers up and over and down has a large distance of coverage. I call that, you know, cascade effect, meaning that that one graph 
travels here and it travels there and it covers the crown. Picture number six, it just covers a little going down. Picture number one, it covers up, over, and arc. So each graph has a much more power, has much more greater power up there. So I emphasize when I'm looking at the crown, where can I prioritize it? So one, two, three, upper arc, and one being the, this up, and then three has a little less coverage. And then four being the, the part of the lower arc that reaches up, and then five having some more travel, and then six has having a limited travel going down. So these are important things. This is all in my book. As you know, I don't make much money on that, so I hope you don't think that's some kind of commercial thing. Um, but it, I, I'm very passionate about the book because this is all in there. I, it's to, to meant to educate. Uh, if, if you couldn't tell, I love that. So this here is the, the, the graph size is one, two, three, four follicular unit graphs. Um, there are very few fours out there you know, in nature, but just to say where you're going to prioritize your larger numbers are going to be in that same zone that you heard. You don't want to use too large a graph in the central world because it could look a little unnatural. And if the, the finer the hair, the bigger the graphs you could in the central world because that's an important area. You think about how much spread that central world is going out and covering. But you don't want to make it so big that that center world looks abnormal. Um, what do we use? I tend to use needles. I can use. I start, start doing more little micro punch instruments now. But ultimately, this, these are great instruments. You know, I don't really use a 20 because those are really accommodating one hair graphs for the most part. And you don't really need that when you're working in the crown. You can actually take those one hairs and pair them together and place them into a single site called follicular uh, pairing or family, familial pairing. And then 19s I would accommodate in general two hair graphs. And then 18 gauge would in general uh, accommodate three hair graphs. And then you can also do what's called uh, Diaphragmatic unit or multiple unit graphs, which we'll talk a little bit about. Again, this is an advanced presentation. It just means you're pairing two flicker units together in the right circumstances. So, just to show you some patterns, I haven't really completed this. You see a little bit more. I got to go into the uh, upper portion of this image, but you can sort of see the pattern. So, you want to start looking at recipient side patterns to really understand this. Thanks, Vance. And so, it's you can see that it, this is a counterclockwise uh, whirl for, on, on the right side. And you can see those transitions, this is the opposite. This is a clockwise from the left. And you can see those transitions going up to, to meet the vertex transition zone. And then the lower arc going down. The angles, we heard about angles for the last couple days. The angles are very low when you're dealing with the uh, front. We heard that's so important so it looks natural. The opposite is in the crown. Why is that? Well, there's a few reasons, three reasons. One is the fact that you create a round profile. If you've got really low angle graphs in the back, they're not gonna create that rounding effect from the side view. The second reason is that it adds visual density. Think about this, when that graph goes up and out, I'm sorry, up and over, it doubles, doubles back on itself, it creates more visual density than one just sort of lying flat. On the, on the crown area. So it actually creates all this visual density. And the other reason is you can get them tighter. When you have them really low angles, you're not gonna really get that tight placement. And again, just like everything in nature, there are no abrupt changes. So you can see that it goes from low progressively to high, and then high progressively to low. So everything on the hair is natural, small changes. And here's just a, a full model to have you see it from a different perspective. So this is a case study. This is a gentleman that has not a complete hair loss. And you see that if I just created my own world wherever I wanted to, I have to fight against a lot of his remaining hairs. So I'm going to use those hairs to my advantage. And I'm following where his pre-existing uh, crown hair uh, world was. So this is uh, a little video just showing you making some sights from the center of the world. Uh, this is using a 19-gauge a uh, needle bent. You sort of saw that when I was working yesterday. And you can sort of see, the more that you see hands move, the more that you can sort of memorize it. You know, it's very, very helpful and instructive to watch videos and watch people move. And that's why this, uh, this curriculum, I think, is so important to have that hands-on component. And this is showing you going farther out with the three hair uh, sites, in other words, 18 gauge, and I'm just going beyond. I'm gonna show you in a, a schematic in a second uh, where we're covering and also a, a still photograph so you get a better aerial shot of this. So again, just sort of look at the, the hand movements. So this here is basically the two hairs in the center, and then most of what you're seeing is the three hairs arcing out in the green arcs. Why do I make three hairs asymmetrically going over to the left? Because here's a creative part, and that's what I want to encourage you as surgeons, is, is not to think of this as tedious work, but creative work. So you're actually creating these angles that arc up 
you, your three hairs are being leveraged to the left of the whorl because you can see that cascade effect going up toward the, to the vertex transition zone and arcing down and cover the lower arc. Compare that if I did a lot on the right where the, it's very limited distance on the crown. It's only going to cover a small area. So those three hair graphs are not going to be leveraged well. And I hope that makes sense. And again, if it doesn't, I'm sorry, this is, a, this is an advanced topic. And these are six, this is a 16 gauge to put diflucal unit graphs in an area that I believe is aesthetically powerful, which is the vertex transition zone in the very upper recess of the arc. You can see this with a schematic right here. So what you're seeing in orange is the two hair graphs. What you're seeing in the pink are three hair graphs. And what you're seeing in the blue are diflucal unit graphs. Now, as a point of not confusion, a lot of people don't do diflucal unit graphs. It's fine. I do. And I'm just, this is why I want to show you what I do and why. Finally, we're going to finish up with the 19 uh, gauge needle to go with the final two areas that are not as important, areas that are less aesthetically important, the lower arc, and maybe not as visually tight and dense as the areas that I just showed you. And we'll finish the work here with that movement. So it's the same movement. And this you see is just radi radially going outwards. And you can see I'm just finishing off the work with those remaining oranges it, signifying two hair graphs or sites for two hair graphs. Um, this is what I always do for my staff so they understand. I always draw a little color-coded image so that my placers know where things go. And I think it helps them out a lot. So at least what they told me, and I enjoy doing it. It's part of my desire to be a pseudo-artist. And these are just when the, uh, the graphs are already placed. You can sort of see the final product. And it's really important patient positioning, especially when you're working in the lab today. I'll, I'll re-emphasize that. Remember that when you're working on the, the frontal hairline, when the patient is supine, it's the easiest because you keep the angles really low this way. But when I work on the crown, I have them almost sit, uh, sitting up, and I, I'm standing typically, not always, and it allows me to work on the upper arc this way and keep my angles high, the exact opposite of the front. And then when I'm working on the lower portion, if, if I'm having the lo lower portion going in clockwise, I turn them over to the left so my hand doesn't have to torque as I do that in the opposite of the case when I'm doing counterclockwise uh, creation for the lower crown. So I typically, in, if I do multiple stage sessions and the person's ball from front to back, the biggest mistake is trying to cover everything. You absolutely, in majority of cases, I would say 95% of the time, don't want to cover the front to the crown in one shot. Don't have enough graphs to do it. So focus, number one, on the front because of aesthetic priority. Then I typically go back and do the crown, a uh, second stage. And as I said, the crown is very hard oftentimes to get the result in one. So I'll come back with a third session and fill in whatever I didn't quite fill, maybe areas of poor growth, other areas that I I need more visual density, and I usually tell them three, although not always do they need the three. This is just showing a clockwise whirl. Okay, this is the gentleman that was in the schematic earlier. And this is the showing the rounding effect that occurs. Okay, it's not complete visual density because it's hard to do that in the crown with one session. This is a gentleman that had literally like seven to eight procedures of transplants and multiple scalp reductions, and this is one session to at least correct that, that slot deformity. You can almost see that the, the hair angles are off the way this was, you know, he didn't have the what's called a triple flap repair to get it to look better, but this is uh, a correction with one session. And you can see when people are on finasteride, sometimes they retain some of their crown differently, and this is just an unusual shape from, from medical management, I believe. And then this diffuse pattern that happens in women, this is just an isolated crown. I rarely do that in a woman. And these are just finer graphs to show you that it really still works enough to get coverage, even though it's not 100%. And then this is a, a great example when you're just having all the, the angles going the same direction, it really gets you great visual density with one session because this is almost the anti-crown. It's just the upper arc going up toward the vertex transition zone. So uh, thank you for your attention.